Let's let's make a start. I expect there'll be some some more people turning up, but we'll we'll make a bit of a start on this. Okay. First of all, um, last week we introduced this idea of the S plane. Okay, which is really just a tool that we've got, a graphical tool that allows us to see the shape or the roots, the poles, whatever you want to call them, the shape of the equations that govern uh, the behaviour of these systems. Okay. So we've got this graphical tool, and it's based around the, the polynomial expression that describes the, uh, the behaviour, comes from the transfer function. We will be coming back to that as a design tool in a bit, but what I want to introduce you to today is a slightly different thing we can do with the, uh, with the S-plane, and that's to do with what happens if you've got a function but you've got a variable in it. Okay, so as we looked last time, we looked at the dynamic behavior of these systems is incorporated in the transfer function. Here we could even rearrange the transfer function to give the, the differential equations that, dis, that determine the behavior. But what if we've got one item in there that's adjustable? Okay, what does that do in the context of working on the S-plane. Okay? So what I want to do, really, is, is answer this question. How does changing a variable in the transfer function change the pole positions? Okay? I'm going to introduce a method for finding the paths taken by the poles as they move around. Because when we change a variable in our equation, then the, the, the roots of that equation are going to change. And as a consequence, the pole positions are going to move around, okay? So we'll introduce a method for finding the paths taken by those poles as they move. So let's start off nice and easy. Okay. Simple first order system up the top there. The corresponding pole position for that would be at S equals minus 0.5. Okay, everybody okay with that? Yeah, that's the value of s that makes the denominator equal to zero, which makes the whole thing infinitely large. Now, I'm only going to introduce you to one particular sort of variable, a variable gain in this case, but we can use the technique for more complex things. So if you imagine I introduce a variable gain into that system, okay, what's happened to the pole? Nothing at all. Okay, it's still at s equals minus 0.5. So that's really not a very helpful thing so far. But what happens when we put that into a closed loop feedback system? Okay, so that forward path up there is still my first order system with that variable gain, but it, it now forms part of a closed loop system. So cast your minds back to all that block diagram algebra and evaluate the closed loop transfer function. Okay, g over 1 plus g times h. Yeah, if you do that, here's the result, g over 1 plus g times h, and simplifying it out into standard forms, what I end up with is, is kind of a gain quantity here, and a first order lag here. You can check the algebra yourselves if you want, but but I think it's right. So when we introduce this gain into the closed loop system, it doesn't behave in quite the way that we'd expect. Okay. So let's look at what happens. If I make k equal to 1, for the sake of argument, okay, what I get out of this, k over 1 plus k is a half and 2 over 1 plus k is equal to 1. Okay, so my pole position, that used to be 2s, it's now 2 over 2, which is 1s, my pole position has changed. Yeah. What if I make k equal to 9? Well, the amplitude here becomes 9 over 10, and the time constant here, which we use to, to find the pole position, becomes 2 over 10, 0.2s. <clears throat> so the pole position now 
will be at minus 5. So it's moving again. Let's make k bigger still. Let's make k 99. So that becomes 99 over 100. And the time constant here becomes 2 over 100.02. So the pole position is at minus 50. Okay, so it's clear that the pole position depends on the value of that gain k. <coughs> when k equals naught, it's in the same place as the open loop pole was. Okay, when k equals naught, that pole will be at 2 over 1 s, which is where we started from. Okay, as we increase that gain k, then the pole position is moving. <coughs> and if you, if you remember just a couple of minutes, the, the, the examples I took, the pole was moving from minus 0.5, and it was moving leftwards, minus 5, minus 50. It was, if I had my S-plane up here, it would have been disappearing off to the left, still on the real axis, but disappearing off in that direction. Okay, so changing the gain k makes this system's dynamic behavior change. That's a little bit counterintuitive because what we'd expect by putting a gain into a system, you think, well, what do gains do? Well, they make things bigger and smaller, don't they? So what actually happens to the amplitude in this closed loop system is that depending on the value of gain, what happens if I make k infinitely large? What, what does that become? k over 1 plus k when k is infinitely large. 1. Okay, so again, sli <coughs> excuse me, slightly surprisingly, when we think of putting a gain into a system, we, we, we think in terms of, of making things bigger. But because of the way that the closed loop configuration works, all that happens as we increase k is that that system overall gain gets closer and closer to 1. Okay? It doesn't get any bigger than that. And that's what one of the features of the closed loop layout as it's shown here. Is that we can, we can use any value of k in there and all we're doing is we're pushing that overall amplitude term here simply closer to 1. When k equals 1, it's 0.5. As you make k bigger and bigger, it just goes from 0.5 up towards 1. So, I could digress here and start telling you about this particular format of, of negative feedback was developed when they were, or, or partly developed, um, when they were stringing telephone lines across the United States. We had very, very long distances. Okay, and what was needed was, was repeater stations with amplification, so the signal was maintained. And in those days, you're looking at relatively crude, by today's standards, devices, um, valve-operated amplifiers, or even transistor amplifiers. And if the valve was to pop, a chap would travel along the line and replace it with another one. And the value of gain he would get would be different, simply because the difference between two transistors with the same part number on, or two valves with the same part number on. So this kind of feedback mecha mechanism was originally developed, or one of the reasons, in order to make the systems fairly immune to changes in gain. So you could go parts swapping, and it didn't really matter very much. Okay. So in our case, with this configuration, no matter what we do to K, it's approaching 1. The other thing that's a little bit counterintuitive is, again, because in our minds we tend to think of gains as making things bigger or smaller, but in fact the gain in this one is making the system faster. Okay, so by simply putting a gain or an amplification stage in that loop, we're not really making the output much bigger, but we are making it faster. Okay, because the k term appears in the time constant for the closed loop system and the pole position. 
Okay, so it's now clear when the pole position depends on the value of k starting at s equals minus 0.5 when k equals to naught and becoming increasingly negative as k is increased. <coughs> That's a nice simple system, it's only got one pole. So we can, we can sort of work out what happens as we change k. More complex systems, we could still work out what's happening to the roots of the equation, but it becomes tedious, it becomes rather labor intensive. So what we'd like to do is to find a way to study what happens to the pole positions as we change the gain k. Okay? And that technique is known as root locus plotting. Okay, where the root obviously is the root of the equation, in other words, the pole positions, and locus simply means location. And what we're looking at is what happens to the position of the root as we change k between zero and infinity. Okay. For our system up there, it's, it's fairly straightforward. The pole starts off when k equal to naught. It starts off at the same place as the open loop pole. And as we increase k, it moves increasingly negative on the plot. Okay. There it is. And this thing down here, this is the S-plane. That X represents my open loop pole position and the blue line disappearing off to minus infinity on the left is the root locus for that system. We okay with that? Okay, next question, what's the point of that? Well, the purpose for that, if you think about it, is we can relate that variable k to the dynamic behavior. We can determine either with a given k, what's it doing to the performance, or if I want a particular performance, what value of k do I need to dial in? So we can use it as a design tool. Oh, Mr. Gates has let me down. Sorry about that. My, uh, my transfer function's grown a bit since I typed it. Let's expand the idea. Okay, that's, that simple first order thing was a nice simple system. Let's see what happens with something more complex. For more complex systems with a larger number of poles and possibly zeros, the, the paths or the loci will become a bit more complex. Okay, more well, less obvious perhaps. It's still possible to draw them by simply following a prescribed set of rules, which I'm going to introduce you to in a minute on a different document. Okay, and also those of you that have started to use MATLAB for this kind of stuff, there is a command for drawing root locus plots imaginatively titled R locus. So if you, those of you that are playing with the software, you can experiment with that as well. So. Let's do the same thing as we just did with that first order system, but with something a little bit more complex, just to see what happens, okay? And here is my open loop transfer function, spread all over the slide. How many open loop poles will that give me? Four, thank you. Yeah, if you multiply this out, we would get an equation, the highest power of s would be s to the power 4. Okay, so that tells me if I was to factorize it, I would get four roots. So hence, four open loop poles. Do I have any open loop zeros? And if so, how many? One. Okay, and it belongs up here. So where is the open loop zero? Minus 2, okay? Minus 2, if I make s equal to minus 2, that top <coughs> bracket becomes naught. So minus 2 is an open loop 0 for this system. Where are the open loop poles? Well, let's start with that one. Where's that one? Zero. Yeah, at the origin. This first order one? Roughly. Minus three-ish, yeah. What about this? What, how would you find them? 
Okay, I'm not asking you to do this in your head, don't worry. Okay, factorize that quadratic, we get the two poles. Looking at this, it's entirely possible, I don't know yet, but it's entirely possible that they would come out complex as a complex pair. Okay. So I've got one zero and four, four, sorry, one open loop zero, four open loop poles, and I'm building that system into the classic negative feedback sort of arrangement. So, hang on, I have a slide missing, I think. No, it's shortcut. The slide, the slides put it all on. Um, this is actually a MATLAB output because I'm far too lazy to draw it by hand. There's my closed loop system. If you work out the closed loop transfer function, that variable k <coughs> would end up in the denominator equation, which, which gives us the, what we call the characteristic equation for these things, and it's a variable. We've already determined that that would come out fourth order. Okay. So, if I wanted to do this manually to find out what happens as I change k, I could choose a number for k, pop it in the equation, and find the roots of that equation for that value of k. Then I choose a different value for k and find the roots of the equation again, and choose a different value for k and plot what happens to the poles and zeros. Don't know about you, but personally, I don't want to spend my time manually finding the roots of a fourth order equation just because I change the value of k each time. Okay. In fact, I don't think I could, not with a fourth order equation. I have enough trouble with the quadratics. So, evaluating them mathematically isn't a good method for you and me. It might be okay internally in a computer software program to find the roots and do it that way. But what I'd like to find is a more human-friendly way of producing these paths. Okay, let's just look at the, the picture here. One of my poles was as the origin. One was at about minus three and a bit, minus 3.33 in fact. And I had a complex pair coming from that quadratic. And my open loop zero was here at minus two just as you told me they should be. The colored lines represent what happens to those pole positions in the closed loop as I change k. Okay, so this one, the integrator, the one at the origin, as I increase k, travels off to the left and disappears into the zero. Okay. My first order one out here does just the same as that first order system we, f we looked at, which it becomes increasingly negative, goes leftwards along the real axis, eventually ending up at minus infinity. The complex pair is a bit more interesting. Okay. This complex pair here, as k is increased from zero to infinity, these things travel along upwards and rightwards. So, what do you think happens if I increase k to the point where I trip over into the right-hand side? Yeah, it becomes unstable, doesn't it? So, if I could use these pictures to work out, you know, whatever you do, don't increase k past a certain point, I can inform myself about not allowing that system to go into an unstable condition. So, there is a point to these things. Okay, a few rules. Loci start at open loop poles. Okay, so if I draw little arrows on these to show direction, they all start at an open loop pole, which is why I've got four of them. They all finish either at an open loop zero or at infinity. But infinity in sort of any direction, if you like. It could be minus real, positive imaginary, but the, the paths basically disappear off to infinity. That's the other possible place where they can end. Okay, before I move on to the, to the drawing rules, 
let's just look at what we can do with a plot. Okay. As I just mentioned, you can see that the loci associated with that complex pair end up going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the plot. But we know that a point on the right-hand side is unstable or indicates unstable behavior. So it would be helpful if we can look at the graph and work out what value of k puts us in a particular position on the plot. <coughs> uh, let me just, let's not do that. Okay. So let's just say, for example, I wanted to end up, I'd like to scribble on this, but the scribbling device is, is broken, I'm afraid. Um, I'd like to end up with a value of k that puts me precisely on that, on, right on the verge of instability. <coughs> I'm going to go back a slide because that one's easier for me to reach. Okay, no other reason. Same picture. So if I wanted to end up at this point, what value of k <coughs> puts me there? Well, I can work it out extremely easily using a, boat, a, um, sorry, a root locus plot. Let's say I'm interested in this point. What I need to do is to measure the size of vectors from every pole, every open loop pole to that point. So I get my ruler out from that pole, from this pole, from that pole, and from this one, and I'd multiply those together. I'd then measure the distance from all of the open loop zeros to that point. In this case, we've only got the one. And I would divide by that number. Okay. The answer you get is the value of k that places you at that point you're considering. So we've got a very straightforward graphical scheme which lets us work out how much of the gain k we need in order to give us a particular behavior. Okay. And you don't have to just use it for finding points of instability. We, we can choose any design feature of the ones we spoke about last week. Something like if you were interested in a particular overshoot, that would translate to a zeta value, which means we have to be on a construction line at a particular angle. Again, if your root locus intersects it, we can work out how much gain we need to achieve that performance. Does any of that make sense? I'm hoping at least, yeah, we've got one nod, that'll do. Okay, that's the slide from last week. Just to remind you about the design features. So we've got settling time that way, rise time that way. We can indicate zeta or damping ratio based on that angle subtended there. So I can take any one of these design features as a construction line and see, well, does my root locus plot allow me to achieve these features? And if it does, I can work out the value of gain I need to make it happen. Okay, if we can design a system so that the poles will give us the behavior that we want, and then we can evaluate the gain required to make that the case. That's a reminder again. Okay, we had a fourth order system there, a system with four poles. I've mentioned this already, really, but I'll, I'll go through it again. Four poles, four open loop poles, gives rise to four loci, four paths. Okay. Um, and you might at first glance look at them and say, that, that's giving me conflicting information about behavior. Okay. So all this is as a reminder that you need to think about which, which poles dominate the overall behavior. Okay. And the ones that dominate the overall behavior are the ones closest to the origin on the real axis. In other words, don't worry about their imaginary <coughs> distance up, but but the ones that have got the value closest to the origin in real terms. Unless you've got an unstable set out here to the right-hand side, in which case I'm afraid to say they tend to dominate anyway. 
Okay, so I mentioned that last week anyhow, but this is just to reinforce that the dominant poles are the ones with the real value closest to the origin. Okay. So, so when this has got a very small k value, let's say k equals naught, which pole do you think dominates? The one at the origin. Yeah, the one at the origin. Okay, so it starts off behaving a bit like an integrator. That's, that's the dominant behavior. As I increase k a little bit, the pole at the origin, what was the open loop pole, is going to move to the left. Okay, so it's starting to behave more like a first order, a slow first order system. Okay. Uh, and that complex pair is moving to the right. Now at some stage, as we increase k, the ones that dominate, because the single pole is moving leftwards away from the origin, the complex pair are moving rightwards towards the origin, there will become a point where the performance is dominated by that second order pair, okay, because they get closer to the origin. We'll be using that fact to design some controllers later by simply modeling them as if they were just second order and making sure that all the other poles are miles away. So we can force the behavior to into simple second order sort of terms. <coughs> okay, so what's going on? We can, using a simple set of rules, which is what I'm going to show you in a second, plot the changes in pole position and hence the behavior of a closed loop system as a variable gain is changed, I guess it should say on there. Okay, we can impose design requirements and establish the value of k that will give us that performance that we're looking for. And we can also establish which parts of a more complex transfer function are the dominant ones. Next week, last week of term, we finally will design a controller for real. Okay. So far, although this module is titled control, either control systems or industrial control, the module title control, up until now, we haven't really controlled anything, if you think about it. All we've done is we've learned to understand how systems behave, okay, in a, in a dynamic sort of sense, and how to model systems, how to look at a physical system and produce a mathematical model. Next week, we finally got to the stage where we've got enough tools and, and enough information and knowledge that we can actually start to design controllers. That's meant to make it interesting enough for you guys to turn up next week. Okay. Right, let me just bring up a different document. So, and, and this is a little three or four pager that tells you about how to draw root locus plots. Okay, and how to interpret them. And I'm going to go through the example that's there just, just to try and make sense of it. Because so with experience, the technique is actually very, very simple once you get used to it. Okay, I'll just quickly lead you through this document then. Root locus methods was developed in 1948 by a Mr. Evans. Okay, uh, British chap, I think he was a mathematician. Um, and it's a graphical method of determining, determining the position of closed loop poles as parameters are varied from zero to infinity. Now, so far as we're concerned, we're only really going to introduce the concept of one parameter, that gain. Okay, although we can do it for, for different variables in different parts of the transfer function. Okay, so GH, usual terminology. If you work out the closed loop transfer function for that, we get this, Kg over 1 plus Kgh. Okay, that's week three, week two, something like that work. If we take the denominator of that system, and equate the denominator to zero, okay, that is called the characteristic equation for that system. That equation contains all the information I need about the dynamic behavior. Okay? It's a denominator of the closed loop transfer function set equal to zero. And that is what I'm finding solutions for. <coughs> 
Okay, so we can find solutions for, for that equation. If we had the patience, we would do it algebraically. And we would get a whole number of values, that's, of, values of S that satisfy that. Is it worth the risk of putting this on full page, I wonder? No. I think that's, is that better or worse? It's big enough to read? Yeah. Okay, well, I'll carry on then. Okay, so that's the equation that we're going to be looking at. The process of finding points on the S-plane that satisfy that equation is the basis of this method. Okay? We're finding the poles, we're finding the zeros. <coughs> Um, and plotting these, it says that it's best described by relating it to a specific example. So I'll just quickly over the next 10-15 minutes, we'll trot through this example and I suggest that those of you that haven't already done so, pick up this document from Blackboard and, and work through it yourself so you can make sense of it. Okay, top of this page I've put up an example transfer function, that's the open loop transfer function. So from that, we can determine where the open loop poles and zeros are. And in the ideal world now, I would use the magic of technology and start scribbling and drawing the sketch as we go along. But I can't do that. Okay, so how many zeros do we have? Well, none. There are no S terms in the top. How many open loop poles? Three, I reckon. Okay, because that's a third order equation down the bottom, a third order polynomial. Um, and fairly simple to see with this example, although that's strictly not in, a, not in the form I like to present them, not in the standard form I like to use, we can see that we have poles at 0, minus 1, and minus 8. Okay, the open loop poles, they're all real, and they're at s equals 0, s equals minus 1, and s equals minus 8. Let's just see if I can cobble something together with a lack of technology here. Can anybody spare me a sheet of clean A4? Yeah, from a pad. Thank you. Just make it two feet. Can, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try and do this to, to illustrate what's going on. Sorry, it's a bit of a... not the most impressive way of doing it. Okay, so what I'll try and do is I'll just try and draw this thing as we go along. So, sorry about having to swap between screens. So let me just quickly sketch up here. <coughs> There's a bit of S-plane. And we've just determined where the open loop poles and zeros are. We haven't got any zeros. We have a pole at the origin. And I've immediately forgotten where the others were. One was at minus eight, wasn't it? What was the other one? Minus one. So I've got three open loop poles and no open loop zeros. S equals minus one, S equals minus eight. Okay. If I then produce the closed loop transfer function, G over one plus GH, okay, find that characteristic equation which is the denominator of that thing. And there it is. And I've multiplied that out in that case. S cubed plus 9S squared plus 8S plus K equals naught. So you can see the problem here. If I just started to substitute values for K, I'd have to keep trying to find the roots of that equation, which is just difficult and time consuming. So let's dive straight away into our drawing rules. Okay, and for the next five minutes, don't worry about the control, just think about how you draw this thing. Okay. Rule number one, the number of loci is equal to the order of the characteristic equation. Okay, my characteristic equation is third order, I've got three loci. Makes sense, I've got three open loop poles, it's the same number. Rule number two, <coughs> each locus starts at an open loop pole. And that's when k equals naught. And it'll end at an open loop zero or at infinity 
and it, and it ends when k is infinitely large. So that's just a bit of information. Rule number three. Loci run along the real axis or occur as complex conjugate pairs. Okay. What that means from our perspective is that our drawing is always symmetrical about the real axis. Okay, so you really need to worry about sketching the top half and then copying it. So it's always symmetrical. Rule number four is where I can start to draw things. A point on the real axis, so we're talking just about the real axis at the minute, is part of a locus if the number of poles and zeros to the right of that point is odd. Laptop, main visualizer selected. Okay, so let's have a think about that. We're just talking about the real axis. If I was to... place myself there on the real axis, how many poles and zeros are there to my right hand side? Right, you're right if you like. I should have, that's, that's the back of my head, okay? So how many poles and zeros to my right? None. Okay, for the purpose of root locus plotting, please consider none as an even number. Okay, so that is not part of the locus. So if I walk along and I end up standing here, okay, how many poles and zeros to my right hand side? One. One in anybody's standards is an odd number, so that part of the real axis forms part of a locus. Okay, so I'm going to draw it in. And the same is true anywhere between those two points, isn't it? Walked on. Is that part of a locus, that point where that figure is standing? No. No, because I've got two poles to my right. Two is an even number. That is not part of the locus. As soon as I get past the eight all the way off to the left hand side, I've now got three things to my right, which is an odd number. So from that point onwards, everything on that real <coughs> axis is part of a locus. So we've started to draw them. And the only mathematical skill we've had to use so far is counting. Yeah, not one, two, three, that sort of thing, which is great. So those bits that I've scribbled in are part of the locus taken by the roots of this equation. That's a starting point, that's a starting point. So what I've got here are two loci that are coming towards each other and hitting head to head. This is a starting point and logic from that rule 4 tells me it goes all the way to minus infinity on that axis. So I think that one's pretty well taken care of. Okay, let's move on. We've done rule number four. Rule number five, once you're away from the open loop poles and zeros, once you've started to travel along these paths, okay, if we've got any loci that need to go off to infinity to finish, we need to understand in what direction they do it. Okay, what direction is infinity? And what happens is that the loci become asymptotic to certain angles, to certain lines, sorry. You can think of these as construction lines. Okay? And what we'll have is we'll have a locus that needs to disappear off to infinity, and we need to find out in which direction. So we construct these lines. And the construction lines are at a particular angle to the real axis, alpha n, where alpha n is n pi over the number of poles minus the number of zeros, plus or minus, as n increases as an odd integer. Okay. Maybe this is a good time to tell you you don't need to remember the rules. You're always given them. Okay, so for our example, alpha n, let's take n equals 1. How many poles do we have? Three. How many zeros do we have? None. So that's 1 over 3 
plus or minus 1 over 3 radians. Okay. What's that in degrees? Sorry, I've left a pi. It's pi, pi upon 3, beg your pardon. Pi upon 3 radians. 60 degrees? I think so, yeah. Plus or minus 60 degrees. If I make n equal to 3, that then becomes 3 pi upon 3, which is 180 degrees. And if I make pi equal to 5, what you find very, very soon is that the values start to repeat. We start off with 1, which gives us plus or minus pi upon 3. When you get to 5, it's 5 pi upon 3, which is actually 300 degrees. And minus 300 is the same as plus 60. So it very quickly starts to repeat. So we typically only have to work out a couple of these. Okay, da, da, da. plus or minus 60, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 300. So we know what direction these construction lines need to go. The trouble is, so far, we don't quite know where they start from. So the next rule is to figure out where they start from. And the asymptotes intersect the real axis at a point given by the sum of the poles. Well, naught minus 1 and minus 8 is minus 9 minus the sum of the zeros over the number of poles minus the number of zeros, so it's minus 9 divided by 3. Main visualizer selected. So somewhere back here, at minus 3, I've got a set of construction lines. at plus and minus 60 degrees. Okay. I've also got a set of construction lines at 180 degrees. But 180 degrees happens to be the real axis. And we already understand what's going on on the real axis. So that solution is actually telling us the direction this one's going in. Okay. So I've got my construction lines and what the rule said, if you think about it, is once you've gone a long way from the open loop stuff, the, the, the plots become asymptotic to those construction lines. So I'm going to sketch it in. Rough and ready, I think that my loci are going to disappear off towards infinity along those construction lines. Anybody with me? At least one, that'll do. Main PC selected. <clears throat> right, we've got a problem in that our construction lines join the axis in a place that isn't part of the locus. Okay. Maybe flicked across screens too quickly there. So I need to find how my locus goes from, or not, how my locus goes to the asymptote. I'm going to have to flip back, I'm afraid. Main visualizer selected. Okay, so my, I've got two starting points here and here. And the finishing points are off in that direction. So somehow, <coughs> my look, I need to leave that axis and go off to become asymptotic to those construction lines. <coughs> so what the next rule is about is working out where they break away from the real axis. Okay. Somewhere between 0 and minus 1, I've got two separate loci that come head to head and are forced to become complex. And I need to work out where that point is. And it's called the breakaway point. Main menu. PC selected. Okay. Rule number seven, the breakaway point, or break-in, which I'll come back to in a second, the breakaway point is a point between two poles on the real axis, and it's the point at which the variable k is at a maximum along the real axis. In other words, how big can I make k 
so that it still gives me real solutions, not complex ones. Yeah. There's a couple of ways to do this. Um, if you take the characteristic equation and rearrange it, k equals to something, okay, what we're looking for is a, ma is a local maximum in k. So how do, you fa how do you use your mathematics to find maxima and minima? Yeah, differentiate and look for a point of zero slope. So one thing I could do is to rearrange my equation and differentiate to get dk by ds. And what I'm looking for is a value when dk by ds equals zero. In other words, a maximum or a minimum. Okay, and solving that gives me the break away point. It's not as bad as it sounds. And the example up there shows that happening. Okay. Right. If I just explain a little bit about this issue of a break-in point, what we've got in our example are, are two open loop poles, which are starting points. I've got locus coming from each one, meeting in the middle and becoming complex. Okay. If you imagine I had two open loop zeros, which are finishing places for these paths, with path between them, somehow the plots have to come in from, from being complex to being real. Okay, so when this makes reference to a break-in point, it's when the path comes in from the complex plane onto the real axis. Okay? It'll become clearer as you work through some examples in the tutorial, I hope. Right, if you don't like the idea of finding maxima and minima by differentiation, you could sort of cheat, you could cop out and do it graphically. Okay? Because for my plot, I know that my breakaway point is somewhere between 0 and minus 1. So all I'm going to do is put in values of s between 0 and minus 1 and work out what k is. And if you plot it on a little graph, you'll see there that there's a local maximum for the value of k just there. And that gives you also the breakaway point. Okay, so in most cases, in most of the cases we'd be looking at, actually doing the differentiation is quicker. But in some cases, depending on how comfortable you are with the different techniques, you might want to do the <coughs> sort of join the dots approach. Okay, so the breakaway point, well, looking at the, the top answer, it's either minus 5.5 or minus 0.48. One of those solutions doesn't make sense. So we take the one that does, which is at minus 0.48, and that's my breakaway point. Main menu. Visualizer selected. So that in there is at minus 0 0.48. Okay, a couple of other things, one of which is that the breakaway, the loci always leave that axis at 90 degrees. They don't go off at a slope just yet. They might curve, but they actually leave the axis perpendicular. I'm now starting to run out of things I can use to, to help plot this, but, but the one remaining one I can get fairly easily is this locus looks as if it's going to cross the imagin imaginary axis, doesn't it? So can I evaluate when that happens? Well, yes, I can, and I can just about fit that in the time we've got, I think. May Right, I'll come back to rule number eight. Rule number nine, the crossing point of the imaginary axis. Okay, it's given by a thing called Routh's criterion. And if we take the, the characteristic equation again, in its normal form, equal to naught, and what we do with it is we construct a, a, a grid or a little matrix. Okay. The highest coefficient of s we have in this example is s cubed. So I'm going to start with that. And I write in here the value of the s cubed coefficient. I then skip 1 and go from s to the 3 down to s to the 1. And that is that 8 is the s to the 1 coefficient. In fact, I think <coughs> slightly bigger that way. 
The line beneath are the intermediate coefficients. It's 9s squared and ks to the naught. Okay, so I've just put in the coefficients of that equation into a little grid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to complete calculating the grid based on those coefficients. So the s to the 1 box just down there, You take the leading diagonal, 9 and 8, the product 9 times 8 minus 1 times k. Okay, and you divide the solution by the bottom left-hand number. It's a bit like finding determinants, but I think you'll find that the diagonals go the other way around. Okay, so in that case, I get a solution for s to the 1, which is 72 minus k upon 9. If I do the same pattern for this box, it ends up at zero. Let's do the one beneath, again taking the four cells just above it. Okay, those four numbers. Leading diagonal times well, the product of the leading diagonal, which is k times that number, minus the product of the downwards diagonal, which is zero, divided by the term directly above. Okay, work through it, it'll make more sense. Describing it in words is, is not the most efficient. Okay, and what we then do is we look at the whole of the first column. Okay, if there is a sign change in that first column, that means I've got a pole in the right hand side. If there is no sign change, then I haven't. And, and obviously the, the tipping point is if I'm just about to get a sign change, in other words, if I have a value of zero, which is just about to change sign, then I'm right on that axis. So I'm starting off with plus one, plus nine. So I need to make sure that this term here remains positive if I'm going to avoid right-hand poles. Yeah. So, what value of k will let me know that that number is still positive? 72 minus k upon 9. If I want that still to be positive, how big can I make k? Seventy-two. 72. Yeah, if k is 72, 72 minus 72 is naught, naught over 9 is naught, which is right on the boundary of changing sign. What about this one? What, what does this constrain me to in terms of values of k? Well, all that says really is that k's got to be positive, hasn't it? But I'm only looking at k between plus zero and plus infinity, so that's not a problem. So what this is telling me really is that the maximum value of k I can have before I tip over into the right-hand side of the picture is 72. So what I would do is I would put k equals 72 back into the characteristic equation and solve it to give me the point at which I cross from the left side to the right side. But I don't have to. There's a nice cheat you can do. And the nice cheat is to take a thing called the auxiliary equation, which is that s squared line, 9s squared plus k, 9s squared plus 72, and solve that instead is much easier. Okay, the only thing that's going to give us a purely imaginary value is that sort of second order equation. And if you solve that, you get plus or minus j 2.83, which I can just about squeeze in before the next group comes into the room. Main selected. So that point there is a plus 2.83, and that is at minus. Okay, and the best we can do with this level of sort of construction point then is to draw the best smooth line we can through the points that we know about. Okay, that's taken longer than I'd hoped, so we'll have some practice in the tutorials about how to get the information back from this that's useful. Have a look at a document on Blackboard and hopefully it will make sense.